Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Seth Williams and you're listening to the RE Tipster Podcast. And today, I finally get to talk with a guy that I've been paying attention to on Facebook for the past couple of years. His name is Matt Peterson. Why have I been paying attention to Matt? Because he's clearly somebody who has found his stride as a land investor and he seems to be doing really well uh, in the business. And from what I understand of his story, I don't, I don't actually know a ton about him. I just know... He's doing pretty well, and there's a lot we can learn from him. But from what I know, he started as a part-time land investor back in July of 2016. And in his first year, he bought 72 properties and sold 54 of those. Half were for cash and half were on terms, so he kind of has experience in both realms. In January 2019, he pulled the plug on his corporate job in project management for a Fortune 20 company. And he decided to jump into land full-time. And uh, to date, as of May 2022... He's got two full-time employees and a few VAs as well. And the fun thing about talking to people like Matt is that whenever we have conversations like this, it's a really cool reminder of how everybody is a teacher. You know, we haven't even gotten into the details of his business yet, but I already know this guy has a lot of unique experiences and uh, he knows things that I don't know and that a lot of you probably don't know either. So I'm just really curious to uh, learn how he's gotten to where he is, and hopefully we'll walk away with some good ahas from this. Matt, how you doing? How's it going? Good, Seth. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah, glad to have you. First podcast ever, so I'm excited, excited to jump in with you. It's a good place to start, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I love all the content you put out and read it and get to all your newsletters every day and enjoy them. So I'm glad we could make some time for this. Cool. So you're not somebody who just marks those as spam and moves them to your trash can? <laughs> nope. I look at them. I look at them. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Good reading material. Yeah. So why don't we just start from way back when? How did you first learn about land investing and what made you decide that there was something here and that you wanted to give it a shot? Yeah. So my story is, you know, the same as a lot of people. It started back in 2016 or not a lot, I guess, but anyone that's still around and kind of started, there were a lot less of us and it was, it was pretty easy. I'll share some numbers with you here soon, but not easy, but we, I got a lot more acceptances back then for like offers than I did now. Um, and how I got into it, basically I, I heard uh, Mark Podolsky on a podcast. It was the Side Hustle Show podcast. And I was commuting four hours total for work every day. And working like a 12 hour shift on a on a construction project site as as a uh, project manager in construction and just listening to podcasts back and forth back and forth every single day and heard that was like man that that could be fun you know i'm an, I'm an outdoors and then i like hunting hiking fishing and i'm like maybe i could maybe i could fill up land we should look into this so i started looking into it ended up buying that his course didn't love it, so went to a, nif a different course, bought that, that worked really well. So that was July 2016, I bought the first course. August 2016, I bought the second course. And my first mailer went out September 24th of 2016. 958 blind offers to middle of nowhere, an hour west of Lubbock. So most people call it West Texas, but way up in the panhandle. Yeah. And uh, from that... What was that? 958 blind offers. I bought 30 properties. 30 properties from that many blind offers? Yep. Holy cow. Yeah. Man, that is sort of different than today, isn't it? <laughs> it was really, it was a really successful campaign. And my whole, I guess, idea at the time was I didn't want to compete with anyone else that I was seeing. So I literally chose a county where I, or there were no properties for sale. So not a single one. I just sent it and it happened to hit and uh, hit really well. I did really well in that first county. So that was, I was lucky. <laughs> so did you pick that county specifically because there was nobody else there? Or was there some other criteria you used to select that place? Man, I I was trying to like look back and think about that. I, I can't really remember, but I remember looking for somewhere where there was no, like no properties for sale. So it was, I mean, I'll, I can tell you what it was, Cochran County in Texas. I don't, I don't hit that anymore. So, <laughs> so we can all go flood that place now. <laughs> there you go. I mean, I wouldn't really recommend it. I still have some properties there like that I sold on terms long ago and I get a lot of letters for that. So <laughs> some cheap land. What I ended up learning about that, and I, I tried to look this up too, but I couldn't find it before we, we started this, was that there was like this one area in that county that got 
split up by somebody and it was being sold to <laughs> and don't quote me if this is incorrect but this is what i remember from back then like because somebody mentioned something about it one of my one of my sellers um and they said it was being they bought it so that they could get in-state tuition at the university of texas at austin and like i googled it and looked it up and sure enough they if, if i remember correctly they the university of texas at austin did this thing where if you were a landowner in texas you got in-state tuition um and like i googled that a few minutes ago to make sure i was right and there were a bunch of articles on it so somebody just bought a big chunk of land cut it up um there's easements in there the roads were never bladed in some of them were but not not most and wow. uh there were happened to be a bunch of properties there that you know the, the people got out of college and then they wanted to sell so i just happened to hit them at the right time so in state that basically just means it's it's a lower tuition because you're an in-state property owner cheaper correct yep cheaper instead of out out of state tuition it's interesting to figure out those little pieces of knowledge because sometimes i can give you a competitive edge in terms of like why to go to a certain place or like how to market the thing and i've heard similar stuff from other people in the past like uh there are certain foreigners or something like that who there's some benefit they get if they own land in the U.S. versus not. Yep. I'm not even getting good into it because I don't even understand all the details, but yeah. there's stuff like that where it's, I don't know, just, I don't know, kind of gives you a new angle you can work. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it gives you new buyers, honestly. Yeah. So I've sold, I bought properties from people overseas and I've sold, I think I've only sold one to somebody in a different country and they were in Canada, so it wasn't too crazy to do. When you were getting started, what were your first few steps? Started with RealQuest and now I use DataTree just because it's, I think DataTree has a lot more features and functions and you can sort and whittle down to a lot better of a group for what I do now. So RealQuest is still good. And for a while there, I used both of them. I'd plug both data points into each of these and then see what the results were. Because some counties were better than others in DataTree and some were better than others in RealQuest. It's good to have a couple different sources. You can kind of cross check them back and forth. And I don't think there really is a data service that nails everything perfectly. Sometimes you're going to see gaps or holes or just quirks about how one works. So it's nice to have a, a backup if you can justify the expense. Yeah. You just have to analyze every single time you pull data and that's what I, I do it all myself still. So it's, it's not quick. I probably do it in like 30 minutes or so just to make sure I have exactly what I'm wanting. Buying, what was it? 72 properties your first year. That's, that's a lot for a first year. What kind of volume are you doing today? Is it similar or higher than that? Or it's honestly a little lower than that. Cause I'm doing bigger properties, but, um, I mean, that was like, for example, the first two properties I bought were one acre properties and the guy, I hit him with one mailer and he ended up having two properties. And I bought them for 250 bucks each. And then I sold them basically overnight for a thousand bucks. So 500 bucks, sold them for a thousand. Um, and that worked really well. It scared me to death to do that. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> What's well, <Yeah>. a deed? <laughs> <laughs> Since then, we've just been growing and growing and growing and growing. Ended up buying last Thursday. Yeah, last Thursday, I closed the biggest acquisition like money wise to date, it's not a huge property. It's only 5.8 acres and got it for about $71,000. So sweet. What do you think it's going to sell for? So <laughs> it'll be listed really soon as is it's in the middle of a small town in Texas. And it's like one of the only undeveloped properties in that town and there's neighborhoods on every side. So we're going to list it as is, but we're going to market it as if it had the potential to be a neighborhood or something and after we get it listed we're gonna look into all the subdivision rules we've already looked at them but it's gonna take a while to plot it out and get all the subdivision rules so either a developer wants to come in and buy it as is knowing it has the potential to do that or we'll end up cutting it up into like a neighborhood and then selling off all the little lots but part of it's right along a like the business highway in the town so the front or the, the strip along the business highway is commercial and then everything behind it is residential. So it's a neat little property. Do you think you're gonna like double your money on that or any idea? There's not tons of comps that have sold, but there's listed comps right now that put it at like ours would be three hundred and fifty thousand. Wow, nice. Like easy as is. So but if we cut it up it's it'll get a lot more than that. Just because it's individual residential lots. Yeah, do you subdivide stuff or 
I've subdivided in the past. I've never done it where we had to plot it out and get it approved with the city. Um, it's always been just subdividing based on the legal description, and then I get new APNs with the county. So mainly, mainly Texas stuff. <laughs> it's it's easier to do that in in the middle of nowhere, Texas. So yeah, I know. Sometimes I hear like, yeah, just subdivide it. It's like, well, you gotta know how it works in that area. Like, is this a rubber stamp easy thing, or is it like years of trying to get approvals and all this stuff? So. Yeah, in Texas, it's pretty easy in most part. Well, unless you get into like a city. Generally speaking, if you keep anything over 10 acres, you don't have to plat it out and get approvals. So like the last subdivision I did was 166 acres and I cut it up into eight 20-ish acre properties. And that increased the value substantially, like very large. So it's, it's definitely worth doing if you can figure it out. <laughs> once you do it once somewhere, you know how to do it from then on. Yeah, a few things come to mind. So you got two employees. What are they doing for you exactly? What roles do they serve and, and what, what kind of work is left on your plate versus their plate? So I've got, it's, it is kind of two employees, but so I had my first hire full-time in, when was that, September of 2020? Yeah. And then the second one is my brother ended up wanting to quit his job too and ended up coming on with me last March-ish. So he kind of does the same stuff that I do, but then the lady that works with me, she answers all the phones for both acquisitions and sales, responds to all the emails, all the all the messages we get. Basically, she takes all the acquisition calls, come into her, and then she fills out a spreadsheet. And then I go through them and look at, you know, what do we want to move forward with? What do we not want to move forward with? And I flag them for her to take action on and now we close everything through Toddle. Like I don't do I don't do any self closes anymore. So it's all it's all going through Toddle companies. So it's just a standard purchase agreement, one page purchase agreement we have that she fills out, sends it to them on DocuSign, and then it comes to me on DocuSign, and then off to the Toddle company. And then once we get that, we're still selling in house as well. So I haven't I haven't broken into using realtors or brokers much at all yet. Um, I've got two proper. The first two I've had a realtor or broker with are. Well, I sent it to them three months ago and not having a great experience <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that definitely. That happens sometimes. I know there's different ways you can sort of seek out those land specialized agents and that kind of stuff, but I don't know. Even then, it's kind of like hiring people, you know? Like you can do your best at trying to find good qualified people, but you don't really know until you just jump in and see what they can do. And sometimes they can't do a whole lot. I would love to find some good agents, good land agents. Cause I would, I would definitely do it. But like, I mean, this one, I sent two properties to this broker and they just, the listing wasn't, I couldn't find the listing anywhere. And I'd look on their website and like dig and dig and dig. And I had it professionally drone and gave them the drone footage and they had like one fake photo of it. And I'm, Last week, I, I gave them a call and told them, we need we need to up this game a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. So sounds like you're still figuring out the land agent thing, if that ever happens. So for the most part, in terms of selling stuff, it's all handled in-house, right? Either with you or uh, the lady that works for you? I mean, it is all in-house. I've got VAs that will like edit the photos. And if you look at any of our listings, we have like little descriptions on the photos and then our logo. So the VAs will do that. But other than that, it's it's all in-house. I mean, we've got like templates and stuff where a lot of it's copy and paste, but now we're trying to make our listings. When I first started this, my listings were, you know, pretty basic. And now I try and do a lot more to where a lot of stuff is hyperlinked. I'm giving documents that you can click on and download. And it's, it, it's pretty in depth. It takes quite a while to list everything, but I think it, it reduces the amount of questions we get. So we've gotten a lot of um, feedback from people saying, Hey, y'all's listings are great. Like I love, like whenever I see a for sale sign, it doesn't have a price on it. I'm like, why, why, <laughs> why would we want to do that? And, uh, so we, we put everything on there that we can and it, it helps reduce the call volume on the sales side. What listing websites are you finding get the most traction for you? Does it kind of vary depending on the market or is there like a standby where it's like, yes, it's always got to go here. This is where most of the sales come from. Is there such a thing? We use land.com for pretty much everything and got a signature membership and can do 30 properties on there. Um, but we've got, I've got like eight to list this week. So we've got something like 
50 properties in inventory right now. And so we kind of rotate them through that 30 listing category. I put it everywhere else too, Facebook Marketplace. Started using land listings some, but when I look at where the traffic comes from, from what, like to our website, land, list, land listings is at the bottom still. I, they're definitely growing, but it's, I guess, not as popular as land.com still or lands of america or Landwatch since they own all of those but i think most qualified buyers come from lands of america and Landwatch. yeah gotcha or land and farm it sounds like you've got you've got your stuff figured out in terms of putting together good listings when it comes to photos and that kind of thing what's your best system for that like are you just doing craigslist postings for local photographers or finding them somewhere else or what's your best solution i know sometimes that's a hassle to i don't know just get reliable people who can actually do a good job yeah, I mean, a lot of times in the, all the land groups now, like yours and all the other ones on Facebook, you can just search for the keyword, like whatever state or county you're looking for and put drone in there also and find them that way. Droners.io post a lot of lot of things to there. But generally once, if it's a new area, I usually use droners.io. If I can't find anyone like online that looks like they actually do land stuff like in that area um, or land photography in that area. And once I get a good one in an area, then I keep going back to them because it's, they know what I want. I know what they can do and yeah. it's easier. Do you just hire a drone photographer to get pictures from the air and that's it? Or do you get like pictures from the ground as well? Or 90% of our buyers comment on, they love the drone footage and they want it after they purchase a property so that they can have all of it. And for all of our droning, it, I've created a write up through over the years it's changed and I add to but it's basically hey here's everything I want I want it at these different I want it like ground level I want it 100 feet I want it at 200 feet or whatever is under the legal limit and then I want directions and all this I want to loop around the property I want to fly through the property and uh it's it's extensive but it gives us everything we need you get video too or just pictures yep both so good at all because with the videos, I can go through it and pause it and then take snips myself. So it gives me a lot more options for angles and stuff. Do you have a drone by any chance? Yep. Oh, yeah. I've got a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I do too. It's it's kind of funny. Like just, I don't know, the novelty of having pictures from the sky like that. Like it's kind of hard to get bad pictures. Like you sort of point it any which way. And as long as your property is in the frame... It just looks cool. It's just like, oh, cool. Uh, it looks different than what you'd normally see with just some cheap looking images that somebody shot from their phone. So, yeah, it's it's awesome. It's great technology. How expensive is that to uh, hire the typical drone photographer for your properties? I try and pile them up so that they can hit a bunch at a time. And I, tr I always want more than five if I can wait and get enough acceptances in. Um, but it, it varies anywhere from probably 250 to 350 per property. But this is, that's like rural stuff, like gets out there and they got to travel. And some of the guys will even like ask if it's okay to camp on the, on the properties. And cause they don't want to drive a couple hours back to the nearest town to get in a hotel. And so it's, it's best to pile them up for us at least. We mail, we mail certain areas like a lot, so like. We send out a lot of mail and uh, it we get a lot of acceptances in and can usually get a good pile for a photographer to go hit. So, Does it end up being cheaper when you do it like that? I've never really asked for that much of a discount because, I mean, I know I'm buying all these. So <laughs> like anything I send them to, I'm pretty sure I'm going to buy. So unless there's like a something crazy on the property, which has never happened. And I guess maybe that's another question is when do you... Like, how do you know you're going to do it? Is it because you have a signed purchase agreement or like uh, you've already closed on it? Or like, at what point are you like, yep, it's a go. Spend 300 bucks. Now it's usually always in title at some point. And I'll have like a a back out exception in our, our purchase agreement that I tell the buyer or the sellers that, hey, like we're going to. By signing this, you agree to let us go see the property. And if there's anything like waste or whatever on the property, squatters, we can back out. And they agree to that. And I've never had it happen. So knock on wood. <laughs> Hope that never happens. <laughs> yeah. Probably will eventually. What role is seller finance in playing in your business these days? Like, are you actively trying to do them that way? Or you just give people the option? Or 
it was really big for a few years there and probably the first three to four years I was in business, seller financing was very popular. I'm, I don't know exact splits, but probably 75 to 80% of our sales were going to seller financing and that's, we still have 40 ish notes, but now that we've gone into more expensive properties and more higher price properties, people tend to buy them for cash. It's just a different, different clientele and different audience that you're pitching properties to. How expensive is that? At which point they start becoming more cash than seller financing. Is it like over a hundred grand or something? Or? I mean, everything, let me think about this year. I think we've sold like two on financing this year. I think that's it, man. Like sales price of probably 25, 30 K and over it becomes substantially less popular to do. Yeah. Is it because they're like going to buy it and build a house on it? Or like, they're just super wealthy people or I don't know, like what would be the reason? Do you have any sense as to what's going on there? I'm not sure. I mean, it's at the higher price point properties. It's probably just people with the, like uh, the term in our industry is the bass boat properties, right? That was coin bone of the other land flippers. And it's, I think it's just more of a clientele base probably or different areas. Like we're working in different areas now too. So that's not the desert squares that, that are super cheap that you can become a landowner very easily for, you know, hundred bucks a month or whatever you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have going for like a CRM system? How do you manage all this activity? Is there anything <laughs> super fancy you got going on or? I do not have a CRM at all. I still use Excel for everything. Um, I mean, we use Microsoft Office for, or like OneDrive for our shared folders, but everything's in Excel. It's It works. I had a call with one of the people that sets up like CRMs for a bunch of the land flippers the other day, and I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. I probably will at some point, but I mean, honestly, it, we're usually doing like 50 to 60 properties a year at this point, and it's... Excel is not that hard. I mean, I just, I go through it and I say, yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, no. And send the contracts to title and close them. So it it could be better. There's always ways to improve, but we're working on, uh, working on Excel still. Yeah. What do you use? Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. Honestly, I think it's just cause I'm not doing crazy volume. So like, I don't know, the need just isn't there. And it's, um, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like you said, like, it could be better. It's not like it's perfect or anything, but like, I get it. You know, I don't need training to figure out how to use Excel. It's just there. I know the formulas. I know how to make different spreadsheets talk to each other and all this stuff. And, um, it's just easy from a training standpoint. And there's CRM systems where like, it literally takes weeks just to figure out how to use the thing. And if you're doing like, you know, 50 deals a month or something like, you know, I get it. Like it, it can totally make sense. And if you've got like a bunch of different team members involved and uh, I totally think there's a time and a place for that. Um, and there's also different like CRM systems that aren't even really CRM. Like they might handle one stage of the process, but not everything from start to finish. So yeah, it's, I, I don't know that there's like one correct answer for everybody, but um, for the way my business currently works, it's just, I just don't really need it, but I can see how some folks would. So it kind of sounds like you're almost on the, on the line, you know, like. You can make this business explode very quickly if you want to, but I think it depends on like for me personally, I don't know if I want that large of a business. Like, do I want to handle all that? Like I'm very comfortable where I'm at. What do I want to do? And for, like you said, like 50 deals a month, well, instead of doing that volume, can I just go up in price point and do five deals a month for much, much, much more expensive properties? Or can I buy five subdivided deals and cut them up into, you know, whatever every month and, or even every year, you can do five a year and do very well still. Um, and there's, there's, some, there's guys doing that in this game. There, there's most of them are silent though. <laughs> you don't know a lot of the names. Yeah, that's very true. I talk to people all the time who are huge, like, way bigger than anything you ever really hear about in like Facebook groups and that kind of thing. But like you said, it's like, they don't want to talk about it or they're just, they're not, they're not really looking for like fame or notoriety or being known. It's just like, Hey, I got my thing. It's working really well. I'm going to keep it to myself. Yep. And, uh, it's nuts. I love seeing those people are hearing about them. <laughs> yeah, I, I do too. It's cool just to know, like, 
a lot of stuff is possible. And sometimes I see the assumption that people have that like, sort of when I look at your situation, it's like, why don't you just leverage this to the full tilt and start making millions a year? Like, how come? What are you waiting for? But it's like, some people don't want that, you know? Like, maybe it's about enjoyment. Maybe it's about being able to manage your life. Like, maybe you have enough. It's not like, it's not like it's the wrong thing to not go that path that everybody assumes you're supposed to take. Yeah, it's, it's all about the lifestyle if you want that. Yeah, exactly. I don't know, maybe it's too soon, but is there a CRM system you're looking at that you think might be a good fit for your size business? Honestly, I had one call with, with the girl that does it, and that's that's all I've gotten to. So I'll, I'll look at them at some point, but it's it's not required, right? It's not it's not a necessity for my business to, to have that. So it's kind of like a, okay, if this is going to actually make myself and the people that work with me happier and make our lives easier, then yes, we'll do it. But if not, then why would I do it? <laughs> right. So I'm still trying to figure them out, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, man. You have to keep me posted on what ends up working for you. If anything, we'll do. When you think back, all the deals you've done to date, are there any examples that stand out as like remarkably cool deals, either because they're big or the circumstances were interesting or the profit margin was, uh, I don't know, exciting. Or I don't know. Anything like that come to mind? Yeah. I mean, lots of them. <laughs> There's just a lot of deals that have been really cool, but, um, I've got some very odd ones. Um, bought a property <laughs> this, this just happened, bought a property in the middle of a national forest in New Mexico and had a cabin on it it's connected to another property so we bought the one that has a cabin on it the other property has a better cabin on it and they wanted to sell also but then they got like sick and went away for a while like we couldn't get a hold of them and we were these are only two properties in the middle of this national forest i mean they are prime and um i even had like a local broker go out there my brother and i went out there and like the local broker evaluated them for us and everything. And I can't even make this up. A few weeks ago, they a uh, wildfire went through the area, completely burned down everything. Oh, no. <laughs> so I don't know what we're going to do with that now. But um, it's still a really cool property. Like a creek runs through it. It'll probably be a, a long-term hold property, we'll say, <laughs> until the forest grows back. But um, that was unfortunate. But... We'll see. Yeah. Do you know like how, how many years it would take for the forest to grow back the way it was? Are we talking like 20 years or something? I'm not sure. I mean, I know that when I was in college, man, I think that was 2008-ish, a fire went through Bastrop, Texas, like close to, I grew up in Austin, so it's it was between Austin where I went to college kind of, and um I'm trying to remember what it looks like last time I drove through there. I'm like, I think there's trees growing back, but it definitely doesn't look the same. Um, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, property taxes are minimal, so it's a cool property. I know it'll be cool at some point. Um, we'll, I've got a few different ideas to, to see what happens on it. But yeah, that was just really, that was an unfortunate one. Yeah. <laughs> it, it begs the question though, like how do you quantify the value of the dirt versus the trees that are on it or like the view or I don't know. There's uh there's these different intangible things that I don't really know how, like it's definitely worth something. You can't deny that, but like, how do you yeah. know that and really accurately estimate it? And uh, I don't know. I don't know. Let me just seem to see like other properties in the area. Like if the values plummet because of that, although it sounds like there's probably not many comps around there, right? No. That's that I had to send a local broker out there. I had no idea what it was worth. So, um, but it's, we've got a few different things working for it. The forest service, it's like two miles off a County road and it is through some rough stuff and the for it's through national forest. So the forest service was supposed to be issuing us like an official legal easement to use that road. And we'd get, they gave us the codes for the, all the gates already. Um, and then we've also applied for elk tags for that property. Should be hearing about those in June. So coming up here in a few weeks. And if we get those, we might be able to work work some other angles, like local hunting guides or I, I don't know. 
not I'm not sure on all the legalities of hunting in New Mexico, but um, this property had all the has all the well, I guess it had since it burned down. Um, it had all the qualifications to um, be able to apply for the permit, and then I think it's like a drawing system, so we had to wait for the drawing to happen, and that was supposed to happen mid May, and we're supposed to hear it by mid June whether we have a we get an elk tag or not. So I don't know what the fire does to that though. <laughs> not vegetation there anymore hey, what is an elk tag uh it's just for like hunting like a it's a hunting license basically but you need a tag state issued tag in order to hunt the elk so i've i've never done it in new mexico so i'm not sure the exact laws i read through them and applied but i'm not sure if we'll get it yet or not you mentioned earlier that you send out a lot of mail so what is a lot of mail Which last you year so 2021 sent out 108,000 blind offers and we bought 64 properties from that. Cool. And that was targeting like higher end, larger, more valuable properties? Mostly, but there's still a few areas that I've just been working for so long that I, I'll hit those areas like once a year still and pick up a couple properties here and there, or just like areas that I like to go to or I go to often myself and it's still fun for me to flip them there. But yeah, it's, there were a lot more acceptances than that. I don't track like the whole response rate and acceptance rate, but our log is stacked full of acceptances still. And we just take the, the best of the best ones. So there's always a, a honey pot to go back to and dig into if we need to. But it sounds like the acceptance rate has clearly gone down from what it was when you started, right? When you send out less than a thousand, you got 30 deals out of that. So yeah, <laughs> kind of a different world. Oh yeah. Would you say those are different, different caliber properties though? The when you started versus what you're going after now? Yeah, I mean, especially at the very beginning where I was buying them for 100 to $250 for an, an acre in the middle of nowhere, West Texas. Um, and now it's the price point is much higher for the acquisition. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a higher caliber property for sure. It sounds though, you know, I've heard a similar sentiment from other people who are similar to you and, you know, are making some pretty good money from the land, land businesses. Mm hmm yeah, you know, kind of like we said, they're not like obsessing over response rates and accept. It's like just blast out a ton of mail and something's going to happen. And it does. So, yep. but they're not like paralyzed by, oh no, like the percentages change. Everything's broken. I can't do this anymore. Like they're just keep the wheels going and it'll keep happening. Yeah. I've, fit, I've found that instead of, I've never tracked that because I'm like, that's a pain. <laughs> like, what? It's just that that's not going to work for me. Um, and instead I'll keep X amount of dollars of acquisition dollars in the pipeline at all times. So we'll have, I mean, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars in the pipeline at all times, just so we know, yes, there's properties that's coming up that'll close every month for us. And that's a lot easier than tracking the acceptance rates and all that. It's like, okay, we know we're good. Like we'll be all right if we keep this much coming in on that. So that, that makes me think of a, a good question that I think a lot of full-time land investors and even people who want to do this, a question that a lot of us kind of sh struggle with is how do you decide how much money to like take out of your business to live on or buy a car or do whatever you want to do versus saving all of it and plowing it back into your business? Is there some ratio you're paying attention to or cause like you really could indefinitely do that like never take money out because you can always justify needing more cash to buy more properties but like where do you draw the line so i didn't pay myself anything until i started in q4 of last year so i started paying myself like six months ago i rolled everything back into the business every single penny just rolled it back into the business so that it could keep growing and growing and growing and it has it's worked really well now i usually I, I don't like have a set payment for myself i take enough to live off of obviously but then and now anytime we have like a big cash sale or something like that i'll take x percent off that that varies based on you know my personal expenses do i have something coming up i need money for do i not if i don't need any if I have enough to live on for whatever I'm doing at that moment in time, then I'll just roll it back into the business. I, th I think it compounds a lot quicker, right? Cause that's like, I don't take loans. I don't, I finance all the stuff myself. So it's a lot easier to grow if I have more money in the business. 
you uh, went full time in 2019, right? So how were you getting money from then until six months ago and you started paying yourself? I had a bunch of savings myself and I've got a rental house um, that I rent out that gives me good, good income every, every month. So gotcha. Had a, have a few different things going. Maybe we can segue into that topic. So when did you decide, okay, I can quit my job. I can do this full time. Like what did it take for you to be comfortable doing that? Honestly, I was ready. To, I, I proved the concept at first. So end of 2016, I was still kind of, well, I was very new, but I'd proved the concept. And then end of 2017, we'll say the first full year that I was actually mailing a lot a lot. It was like a thousand a month. It wasn't very many. I had made nearly three times what I was getting paid at my corporate job. So I was ready to bounce that time. That was end of 2017, but just wanted to keep doing it on the side for a while and had some good things going at the corporate job and could do it nights and could do land nights and weekends and held out two more years. And then, and then it was, the concept was really proven. (laughs) And, uh, I mean, at that point, that was, what, three, 17, 18, 19, two, three, three years in? Yeah, three years in. So it was, it was a no-brainer at that point. I was, I was costing myself money to, to not be full-time. I did a very similar thing where, like, I could have quit a lot sooner than I did. But for me, anyway, I can't speak for you, but for me, I, I think I was, like, scared. Like, what if this stops working? Or what if there's a dry spell? Or what if, I don't know, something goes wrong? And even though the job was making a lot less, it just, for some weird reason, it felt more secure when it was honestly costing me a lot. It was a huge bottleneck keeping me from doing a lot of stuff that I could have made a lot more money from. Um, It just took me forever to finally get comfortable enough to make the leap. Yeah. Was that a similar thing for you where it was like a security blanket or was was there another reason like benefits or trying to save up more cash for when I do pull the plug or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I knew knew the where I wanted, what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to take this full time, but I didn't want to do it too soon. And yeah, I, since I was reinvesting everything into the business and continued to do that for a while, I wanted to save up, you know, the cash to, to live on for a while before I'd have to start paying myself. And, uh, it, I've, I guess I've never been scared on like the, the downtime, like if this ever stops working, cause it's always worked. Like everything sells, everything always sells. <laughs> um, and if not, you can do something else with it. Like kind of a lot of your podcasts and stuff talked about Airbnbs and nightly rentals and tip camp. I mean, you could do so many things with these properties, storage units, billboards, whatever. So um, it's, it, it, I think if something's not selling, you're just not looking at it from the correct way. I guess if that makes sense, like instead of just trying to sell the land, what else can you do for it? Or if you're not offering seller financing, offer it because <laughs> that opens up your buyer pool to a lot more people. Have you had any properties that like didn't pan out well? Where like, oh, I shouldn't have bought that one. Where you either lost money or broke even, or have you always done really well on everything? We haven't lost money on any property. So we've had some weird, a lot of weird situations. Just closed a odd one in New Mexico, another one in New Mexico that sold on terms. The guy was paying for a long time, ended up moving his whole family to the property in like travel trailers or something. And then he vanished. The guy owning the property next to it calls us out of the blue and says, he's been paying those payments to us the whole time. And I'm like, okay, do you have proof? And he goes, no, but they already deeded the property to me. And I'm like, I, I hold a lien on the property, so, like, you need to pay me off still. <laughs> and it got, it it got a little hairy there, and I, and I ended up having to hire an attorney to deal with his attorney, we'll say. And, uh, but we still came out on top, it just took a while. We still made good money on that, so, that was just, it was just a pain, but. Do you, do you like doing the seller financing thing? Or is there any part of it where you're like, oh, I hate this, or... Um, I know sometimes people like, I kind of got frustrated with it, honestly, my first couple of years of doing it just with people flaking out on me or just the, uh, I mean, you're really developing a relationship with these people. It's not a one and done thing. It's like, you're, you're going to know them for years until they pay you off. Um, and it gets even more annoying when they don't do what they say they're going to do. So 
Has that ever been a problem or an annoyance to you, or are you just kind of you're totally content and happy with to deal with that? With with a lot of the like cheaper properties, there were a lot of annoyances, but now if, if we're going after more expensive properties and seller financing it, I've had less and less problems. Um, so far, everyone that's defaulted or something, we've been able to work out a deal. And like for COVID, COVID hits and so many people lose their jobs and like people stop paying. So I reach out to them and I change their terms and what guys like many, many, many of my customers. So what can't, what can you afford like to pay me monthly? We'll change it for a while just so we can keep going. Right. And then we'll go, we can revisit this again when you get another job or whenever this weird pandemic thing we're going through is over. Right. So, um, I've never had, never not been able to work anything out with people. Um, but it's not really, I love the cash deals, but terms deals, honestly, since they're automatic, most of the time, I'd probably say 85% of the time they're fine for us. How are you collecting payments and, and managing all that stuff? Uh, geek pay. You using like Actum or the uh, Stripe or taking credit card payments or ACH or what's working for you? So we have Actum and Stripe. The um, monthly payments are Actum, like deposits and down payments are Stripe. Have you found that one of the other is uh, more reliable in terms of people paying? Like um, I, I've heard this thing, you know, I can see some rationale behind it that using ACH payment is more reliable, even more reliable than having multiple sources of credit card payment because it's their actual bank account. Like it's easier to just cancel a credit card and be done. But when you got their bank account, it's like, that's, that's everything. Have you seen any trends with that or? So we only take the monthly payments with ACHs. So I'm not, I'm not sure about. That's all you know. Yeah. You know what your default rate is or anything? Like how often do people miss payments or stop paying? I mean, during COVID, it was, it, it got weird there for a little bit, but yeah. if we take that year out, it's probably 15% default rate ish in that area. It's not too bad. It's not, it's not too bad, but I think a lot of it's like contacting the people that are having problems paying and saying, Hey, I get it. Like you're at a hard point in your life, whatever's happening and saying, what can you afford? And then just change their terms. And that's a lot easier than. Is it like if we're getting our money back very quickly, typically on terms deals, it's a lot easier than having to like go through the default process because I don't use land contracts anymore. I close like a banquet on your house. So like everything's recorded. Yep. Yeah. So do you think you want to do land flipping indefinitely or is there some like a destination that you're headed towards? Like do you want to, I don't know, evolve into a different type of real estate or business? And I don't know, what, what's your five and 10 year plan if you have one probably just i mean keep growing this but not i don't know how much bigger it needs to get at this point like pretty comfortable my whole team's very comfortable it, it we could 10x this pretty quickly honestly um but i don't i don't really know if we need to just moving into like bigger property types and more things that we're gonna like either do subdivisions on or build houses on or put storage units on and just creating different types of income that'll like what you said earlier, like, will land ever not work? Well, if land ever doesn't work and you've got a couple couple properties with storage units on them, got a couple hundred storage units, people always need to store stuff. So um, just having like different streams of income. So now I'm looking at every property that we acquire in a different light of not just flipping it, not just flipping the land, but saying, hey, okay, what else could this be used for? And does this make sense? And if it, if it makes sense, I typically, I haven't pulled the trigger on it, but I hold, I personally hold a bunch of our properties that I know other things could go on. I just haven't worked on those projects yet. So like Airbnbs in certain areas are huge. And I know that I can put cabins on properties and rent them out very easily and make a lot of money through Airbnbs, um, which that can be an option in the future, but I, I haven't done that yet in time probably you know it's one of those things where it's like i don't doubt you i'm sure that's correct but it's also like a whole other business you gotta get into yeah it's like we're gonna find the time to do that plus land yeah it's not easy i did i did the campsite rentals i still do some campsite rentals but it is oh do you a lot of work like just dealing with the people because this is this is like 
rural properties. They're in the middle of nowhere. And it is a lot of work for not as much return on investment. Are, are you referring to like the hip camp type thing? Is that what you mean? I've got them on Airbnb, but yeah, it's it's hip camp basically. It's the same concept. It's just a campsite on Airbnb. Well, let's talk about that. Wait, what is the uh what are the hassles? What's the do people like trash your property or something or what's the difficulty? It's just so rural and there's no cell service out there that it if they don't look at all my maps and like download them offline, it, they can have problems getting there and people have to like drive an hour and a half back to the nearest town to call me and it's just it's kind of a pain. I do it on a bunch of properties that I want to keep myself just so that there was some sort of income coming in, but it's, it's, it's on as a lot of work. So maybe the, the takeaway from that, unless there's some other issue is make sure you buy properties with cell service. Yeah. And that maybe solve most of your problems. Do you think that would solve a lot of them? Yeah. If I could just give them a pin and they could put it on, you know, Apple maps or Google maps and drive to it. But there's uh. When you don't have cell service, not many people can find things. That's kind of the kind of the crux of the issue is because once it is within cell cell range, it's probably a more populated area and you probably can't camp there anymore. Yep. So it's like I have to find that sweet spot where like you can do that and there's cell service. And uh I'm curious how much how much do those make per night? Like how big are these properties? I've only got really big properties, anywhere from 40 acres to, uh, I think the biggest one is like 89 acres or something like that. And it's, I don't do it for much. It's like 25 bucks. Airbnb's got this thing where you like, it fluctuates itself based on demand and it, it it's not much. It's very hands-off for me at this point, just cause I don't focus on it. But when I was trying it, it was it was a pain just cause, just cause of the no sales service, honestly. Yeah. I've talked to one other person who, uh, it's not like a huge operation for him, but he's had some success at that, but his properties were like smaller. They were within cell phone range, just kind of a different animal than what you're talking about. But I'm sure there's a way to make that work in an efficient way. It's just kind of finding that right blend of attributes of the property that makes sense for it. Agreed. And that's devoting time to a different different industry other than just land right so it's like yeah i know how much do i really want to work <laughs> totally hear you for somebody like you who's been in this for you know quite a while now i'm sure you probably get into this business with certain i don't know assumptions or a certain understanding of how it was supposed to work you know maybe you heard a pitch from somewhere about something about yeah this is what the land business is like um i don't know what what were some of the big lessons you learned in the first year or really throughout your career so far where it's like people go into it thinking it's going to be like this, but that's wrong. It's actually like this. Like, does anything jump out to you when I say that of like, you know, um, inappropriate expectations of what it is. This is what you should expect. It, yeah. So the, I mean, the first year is, it was hard for me because I was, you know, commuting four hours a day and working 12 hour shifts. And it would be hard. Like I got like, completely drained. And then what I just kept telling myself every night I got home, I said, just to, in this land thing, I said, just finish, just accomplish one thing, one thing towards whatever this land flipping thing is I'm trying to do. See where you're at in a year. If it works, great. If it doesn't quit. Right. And it like it clearly worked in that year. Um, that was the hardest thing for me. Year one expectations that I've seen from a lot of people. They think it's just, Oh, they just buy a property, sell it, buy it, sell it. They don't understand. It's a whole, it's a whole business. Like I was talking to another land flipper yesterday. One of the guys that is doing massive things that he's starting to be heard of, but, um, not tons yet. And we both despise doing our books, like really despise it and just all accounting in general. And like a lot of people don't understand that this is a business. Like it's, it's an entire business. Yeah. What you guys see from the outside looking in is we buy a property, we sell a property, we buy a property, we sell it. But there's everything that goes on with a, we'll say a normal business, right? A brick, say a brick and mortar business where we still have customers, we still have costs, we still have employees, we still have to figure out how we pay taxes and you know all this stuff. So uh, I think a lot of people just think real estate's not exactly a real business, if you will. So that's kind of. Yeah. What most people say. Yeah, I get that all the time with uh 
with most of the businesses I'm involved with, people kind of think it's a joke or it's not real. And it's like, okay, well, whatever. I don't know what you need to see, but yeah. it doesn't matter. I know it's real. <laughs> and land flipping so niche still that like anyone that hasn't heard of it thinks it's fake and thinks you're just not like doing it. I'm like, I'd share my numbers with you, but you wouldn't believe them. Then you just think I was a liar. So <laughs> did I hear right that you fund people's land deals too? Yep. I thought I saw something on your website about how you, uh, how much have you done that? Is it like a common thing or just like once in a blue moon, you'll fund somebody else's deals? Not tons. I get a bunch of properties submitted to me that just aren't, I'm, I'm not interested in, or it's, they're too small or whatever, but I've got a couple of people that I've provided funding to for, it's not tons of properties. It's a couple of properties and then they make enough to where they do it themselves. So if I have the cash handy, then I'm happy to fund deals for sure. Is there like a, a certain split you expect with the people that you work with or how do you figure out the terms of all that? Yeah, it just, it depends on the size of the deal, the people, do I know them? Do I think this is going to sell quick? I think on our website, it still says 50, 50, but that's open to interpretation based on the deal and the people. So like if, sure. if, comp show it's selling in a week for one price and you're getting it for this price, then I'm happy to fund that for a week and get my money back. Yeah. Cause I know there's a lot of people out there who that idea sounds appealing to them because you know, maybe they work the land business and they realize like, this is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It'd be a lot easier to just like fork over my money to somebody else that I trust. Um, so when you look at your experience with that, like what are the great things about it and what are the things about it that are a pain? Like, it sounds like maybe you have to spend a lot of time looking at deals that aren't going to go anywhere. Maybe that's a time waster or I don't know. I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, no, that's definitely the worst part is just people trying to make a deal work that they should just pass on. Just go send out more mail and find, find the next deal. Like, oh, it might have access. It might not. It like, it might be in a floodplain. It might not. I'm like, yeah, we're not, we're not, I'm not going to fund this because I don't think it'll sell very quickly, but I always tell them just get it on an option and then try that. Yeah. I know for some people, especially if they're like newer and they happen to come across what looks like a good deal. Um, you know, I mean, for them, a 50, 50 split might be giving away a lot more money than they need to, but like there's a ton they can learn from somebody like you just in terms of the education standpoint and like the deal wouldn't happen otherwise. So I don't know. It sounds like uh, it could be a good fit depending on the deal and the person and all this stuff, but yeah, I mean, especially for new people, because I get, yeah. I share a lot of my stuff with with newer people and yeah. that I fund deals for. So, do you want to like pursue that in a big way going forward? Or is it just kind of a ah? no? I just I threw it up on the website just so it'd be there and kind of promote it every now and then, but not really. Gotcha. It's I mean, at the end of the day, it's do I want to do that? Like, there's some people that only do that, right? Or do I just want to send out more mail and then? It's only my deal <laughs> and then more profits for me. It's more work, but if you got the right team in place, like we do now, finally, then it's, I'd, I'd rather take my own deals, <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, obviously. Yeah. It's always a, it's a weird thing to try to figure out the right balance for that. Cause, um, yeah, I know it's partnering can certainly allow you to do things you'd never be able to do otherwise, but like you're giving up control too. Yeah. It's like, how much, how much do you want to give up versus control all yourself? I don't really know the right answer, but, uh, I also struggle with figuring out the right balance on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely entertain funding deals, but it's definitely not our main business line. It's more of a shiny object syndrome thing. Like when people started deal funding a lot, like for land, like land flippers doing it, I was like, Ooh, that sounds fun. I should do that too. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's the next thing you're not gonna know if it works until you try it right yep yeah if uh if somebody is uh listening to this and watching this and they see where you're at and they're like man i really want to get to where matt is like i envy his position in life um what would you tell them or somebody who's like maybe thinking about toying around with the land business but they don't know if it's legit they don't know if they can do it I don't know. Does any thoughts come to mind in terms of what you would say to them? I think the quickest and best way to do it is to find whatever program it is that's proven successful. And, you know, don't just find one online, but find people that like, say, find someone on Facebook that's taken that program. Say like your program, for example, I haven't personally taken it, but I've heard a lot of good things. So take that program and just, just do that and just follow the steps. Don't deviate from it. 
don't do what I did and pick a random county in the middle of nowhere to just mail. I got very lucky on that one, but um, like follow the steps in a proven program. Once it proves successful to you, then deviate from that and make your own thing up. Because that's, that's I've I've taught a few friends how to do this over the years, and the ones that are successful listen to what I was doing, so it's working for me. And the ones that weren't, they tried to do their own thing, and it didn't work. So, like, they didn't understand the business yet, and so deviating from my business plan that's proven now was not good for them, we'll say. Yeah, that's another interesting thing, because, like, deviations are probably appropriate for everything at some point. Like, once you have a good handle on it, you know what you're doing, but you don't want to do it too soon, because... I don't know. It's like, is there a reason to deviate or not? Like, do you really know what you're doing? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I think once you learn, once you know the land flipping business, then make it your own for sure. You, you'll find these little niche areas where you're just really good at flipping land in that area for whatever reason, and other people aren't. Like, I've, I've got many areas like that now that it's, I get dozens of letters every week from land flippers. Just blind offers, range offers, neutral letters, just postcards, you name it. And for whatever reason, I can keep mailing those places and I keep getting deals. So that was actually uh, the first time you ever got on my radar was because I got one of your blind offers. Did you know that back in uh, oh. 2017? It was uh, New Mexico. And I saw Matt Peterson. I was like, I'm going to look this guy up and see who that was like one of the first times. So prior to that, like I hadn't really started getting many offers from other people. And I felt like that's kind of when it started happening more and more. And. Anyway, you were the, one of the first people that I got one from. <laughs> that was in the early days because that that was like that wasn't even a company. That was just a website. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what uh, any specific. I just remember your name and looking you up. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. I I can see this guy here on Facebook. <laughs> Bam. Yeah, that was early days. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of a lot of our interviews, we like to kind of ask some questions that aren't necessarily related to the land business or real estate, but just kind of figure out more about who you are and how you operate. So question number one, what is your biggest fear? Hmm. I don't want to, it used to be failing, but I don't think it's failing anymore. Like just not being, man, I don't know. What is my biggest fear? Now, now with employees, it's honestly like, if my business failed, so I guess it might still be the sort of failure. If my business were to fail, now they have to go get other jobs and that would suck. Like that is, it was very hard for me to hire my first employee and it was, it took me a long time to pull that trigger. And uh, now, after I did, it was a no brainer. Like it's been phenomenal. But since she's like one of my really good friends too, if my business failed, then I knew that she would have to go find another job and she's got husband and two kids. And like, I didn't want that to happen. And that haunted me for like months, months and months and months. But then what I realized is, man, this just exponentially improved my business. And yeah, hiring your first person is scary. Like it really is. So I, I didn't know how to do that. But um, once I got her on board and up and running, it was, I mean, it's been phenomenal. So I think business-wise is failing, or my biggest fear business-wise is failing, like the company so that I, I don't care if I have to go get another job, but for other people to have to go get new other jobs too, that would be, that would hurt. That'd be bad. Yeah. It's an interesting thing how, because I have similar stuff where it's like, no, just the idea of failure, it, it feels like this, uh, I don't know, final judgment. Like you are, you know, insufficient as a person. Like that's why this happens because you're no good and you're a loser and all this stuff. Um, but the funny thing is like when you look at work, like we can all bounce back from that. Like there's really nothing that can happen for the most part that would permanently, you know, demolish your ability to make an income. Like you can get another job or do another thing or reinvent yourself. Um, so I don't know, it's weird that, uh, that I put so much emphasis on that, but it's like, I know it's not the end, you know, like if something were to happen, I could, I could get back up from that. It would be painful, but it's not the end of the world. No. Yep. Question number two, what are you most proud of? 
Hmm. My most proud of. I think proving to myself that I'm able to build something from scratch and then also have that support others as well. So it's been like, it's, it's, it's been a wild journey. Like I've always like done side hustles and been an entrepreneur for a long time, but never full time. And being able to not only survive doing something I built from scratch, I took no investments. I took no outside funding at all. And I never have. And then also have that provide for other people and other families as well, where they get to work from home. They don't have schedules. <laughs> they, I don't check in on them every day. They don't have hours. <laughs> like they know their job. This is what they need to do. And other than that, they're pretty free and being able to provide for their families in that sense has been really fulfilling. I'd, I'd say. I know what you mean. It's, it really is a beautiful thing. When you think about like, you get to be free and do something you enjoy and make good money at it. And you get to spread the joy and the wealth, so to speak, to other people who also get to do a good job and yep. not hate their lives. I mean, there's so many people out there who hate what they're doing. Like I've been there. It's a miserable place to be. Yeah. And, and to know that you're able to, to be the source of that kind of good thing for somebody else in the world and enjoy it yourself. Like that's a huge, huge deal. Yeah. The, I got lucky in my first hire is that in my last corporate job, um, she was in document control and was on all my projects and doing document control for us. And so she, she saw me building this company over the years and um, said, you can leave, but just take me with you. <laughs> and so I finally got that. I finally got to do that. And I didn't, I didn't have to hire somebody completely random or that I don't know. I already know this person and I already know how she works and it's been, it's been really good. So definitely got lucky there. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So final question. Let's pretend you just got wired a hundred million dollars to your bank account and you're not allowed to stay on your current career path. So you can't do land anymore. You can't do real estate. You're out, but you can do anything else you want for the rest of your life. What would you do? Huh? I can't do land. I can't do real estate. I would probably, I, I just really love like the hustle, like starting something from nothing. And I'd probably help out business like struggle, not struggling new, we'll say startups in some form or fashion. I mean, obviously capital, but, um, I don't know what those businesses would be. I've, I've gone to like some pitch days and stuff where there's, it's kind of like a, we'll say shark tank since everyone knows what shark tank is. Right. But it's people are pitching for money to investors basically for startups and I think those are really fun to like go watch and I wouldn't just want to give the money because like I want to be involved and I think it's really fun to build companies from scratch. That's probably what I would do because that would be, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money. So <laughs> I'd be able to not only fulfill what I like doing, but to help a lot of other people as well, hopefully start up their dream. I haven't heard that uh, answer from anybody else yet, but that's, that's a great answer. That'd be really cool to do that. So sweet, man. So if people want to, uh, I don't know, find out more about you or get in touch with you. You don't have to share anything, but if, if you want to, is there like a website they should go to or a way they could connect with you? Uh, yeah, you can go to our website, SavvyLands.com, S-A-V-V-Y-L-A-N-D-S.com. And then we're also on every single social media outlet um, as SavvyLands USA is our username on every single one. Check us out anywhere. Awesome. I'm going to try to link to all of those uh, things in the show notes for this episode. You can find that at retipster.com forward slash 131 because this is episode 131. And uh, Matt, thanks a lot for talking with me. Yep. I'm actually, I'm going to try to get you on this uh, podcast for a while. I'm, I'm glad we could finally do this. And I could finally learn more about you. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's been fun. Thanks for having me on. You bet.